Tom and I first met when um, he was director of the Episcopal Public Policy Network. Um, uh, way back uh, in the late 90s. And um, we worked together then on the Jubilee campaign to write down the debts of many of the world's poorest countries. A wonderful campaign, a really great way to get started in this work. And um, it made a huge difference in Africa. And uh, then uh, with that campaign, you know, when, we, when the church group started on this, <laughs> We were really by our lonesome, you know, there were no powerful people who supported this idea of writing off debts for African countries. And, uh, but then as the campaign picked up, uh, we were surprised to be joined by Bono of U2, the band U2. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that was a huge, huge help. Uh, I remember arranging a couple of press conferences where it was sort of, um, uh, Bono and a group of various bishops from different churches in the background is his backup band, you know, because the press was there to see Bono. And um, it really was a huge, I mean, celebrities are important in our culture. And uh, Bono is an extraordinary uh, human being to also be a celebrity. And so uh, at some point, uh, Tom, uh, signed up when Bono, after Bono created, a, a Bono and Bill Gates really launched a new organization, the One Campaign. And uh, Tom went over to work for the One Campaign. He stayed with the One Campaign. He's now the North America director for uh, the, the One Campaign. Uh, and uh, you can imagine that having worked together for so many years that the two of us uh, have really developed a friendship. So Tom Hart, you're on. Thanks, David. Um, it's it's a real pleasure to, to, to talk with all of you. I love this class. I, I would like to take this class. Um, the, the poverty in the community's faith and politics is just, well, it's a, a bit of the story of my career and my life. And, and of course, working with David all these years. So um, I'll just start a little bit about myself. So I was born and raised in Alaska. Uh, my father is an Episcopal priest. Actually, later on, he was elected to be the bishop. Um, and so church is partly the family business. I grew up um, uh, and remain a faithful Episcopalian. Um, and I would say that really did, was foundational to sort of my outlook and my my one of the reasons I wanted to engage in public service. Now I happen to really like politics and government. And so after I graduated from college, I came down to DC, Washington, DC. I ended up working on Capitol Hill for uh, several years for a couple of different senators, uh, really enjoyed that. And, and then I joined, as, as David pointed out, the uh, Episcopal Church has a Washington DC office um, as many of the mainline churches do. Um, I had interned in that office um, one summer during college, and then after several years of working professionally in Washington on Capitol Hill, I, I ended up getting hired there. I ended up running the office for a number of years, um, which is when I got to know uh, David and we worked together on Jubilee 2000 and Debt Relief. It was through that campaign that I, uh, on Debt Relief that I got to know Bono, who became the sort of lead celebrity spokesperson, best known across Europe, particularly the UK, where the Jubilee movement was, was huge, um, very, very well known. And, um, you know, Bono had, had not always been an, an advocate. Um, he, uh, he actually did many, many years before he got engaged in Jubilee 2000 and the debt relief movement got, he helped put on a concert called Live Aid, uh, where they raised I think $125 million um, with that concert, and it was to address famine in Ethiopia. One of the most successful sort of rock star, rock concert charities that had ever happened. And it, actually, I've heard over the years, many people were, were impacted by, by Live Aid. But um, it was one of my very good friends who got, got in finally to see Bono, um, convinced Bono, he said, look, Live Aid was amazing, but that $125 million that you raised is how much poor countries pay in debt service every week to rich countries and institutions. You, you need to get out of the charity business and get into the justice business. You need, and Bono, who was super curious intellectually, very, very smart guy, 
sort of caught the bug that day. He realized that, and of course, that is nothing against charity. Uh, we, huge charitable giving around the world is an incredibly piece of the, incredibly important piece of the puzzle. But for Bono, the systems change, the going upstream and figuring out what policies were occurring, you know, were on the books that needed to be changed in order to, to have that sort of really big impact at scale. That's what attracted him. And that, frankly, even though I had no idea who Bono even was, it, it was one of the things that got me interested in, in public policy as well. So um, we, we met during that campaign and he, after it, it, the campaign was very successful, actually ultimately after many years, about a hundred billion dollars of debt relief was written off, a hundred billion. Um, so it was quite an astonishing accomplishment over many, many years. So I got to know him and he started this new organization. Actually, the first name of it was Data Debt AIDS Trade Africa. Most people thought we were a tech company, mostly with the young Bush administration at that time on HIV AIDS. Um, there was a, uh, there, you know, he, he, this was a new, relatively new administration at the time and he'd come in as the education president. But um, after 9-11, it became really clear that the United States and this president, Bush at the time, needed to be engaged globally. And um, HIV AIDS, mostly, frankly, through a faith lens, and I'd be happy to talk more about this if, if you're interested, um, President Bush came to, to the issue of HIV AIDS through a faith lens, uh, very much of the mind that if we can help and save all these lives, we really, we really must. And so um, eventually, Data um, worked with President Bush, and then eventually we became the One Campaign, a much better name, uh, launched with David Beckman and many other partners as a coalition to help build a constituency um, of people in the United States in support of doing more and better policies in the United States. The One Campaign actually now is, is, um, is global. We have offices in the United States, Canada, the UK, France, Germany. We have an office at the European Commission in Berlin. And we have also have three offices in Africa and that is a growing presence for us. Not to, not to do charitable work in Africa, like so many amazing charities that you're familiar with, but really to do advocacy to African governments, which I think is, is super exciting. Uh, the form of advocacy that you are familiar with in the United States is somewhat new and different. And it's really exciting uh, what I think is happening on the continent there with advocacy. I um, thought I'd say a couple words about advocacy in general. Um, I'm sure at, with David as, your, as the, the head of this class, you've learned a lot about the way it's done in DC. I thought I would describe it for a little bit from, from my perspective. Um, how one does, it, does its work, I, oh, sorry, I should say, so one is o only works on global poverty and disease. Um, we don't do the domestic side as bread for the world, um, which, which I'm sure you're familiar with working with David. So we focus on HIV AIDS, we focus on uh, malaria, and of course right now we're focused very much on COVID, focus on global hunger and extreme poverty. We do work on economic growth, whether it's energy, uh, uh, trying to get people electrification or jobs or other forms of economic development to help bring uh, livelihoods and, and improve lives. And um, we work on transparency and accountability as well to make sure that the assistance that we're supporting is going to the right places and actually reaching the people it's intended to. Um, how do we do our work? Since this, this, David asked me to talk about some of the politics. So how do we do the politics? Well, we often describe it as the six Ps, as in Paul, six Ps. So you start with good policy. You, you, you can't sell a bad product. So you gotta have a good idea that makes sense and, and, and will sell. You have to have strategic politics. And in, and in Washington, that means that it's bipartisan. You've got to work with both sides. You've got to manage not just the good policy, but the politics as well. Um, you have to work in partnership, like the One Campaign and Bread for the World and so many other great advocates work together in partnership. You have to mobilize the public. You need politicians want to hear from their voters. And so that's why we get grassroots to write and call their members of Congress. Um, we, uh, we also work in pop culture. Um, obviously with Bono as your head, we have both with his ability to access the media and get attention, but his Rolodex of friends in the arts and entertainments and sports and other industries. You know, we are a country that, that, I wouldn't say obsessed with celebrity, but certainly it's a good way of getting attention. And then the last is, is PR uh, or 
communications and media, how to get your message out. So those are the six Ps. And I, it's sort of, I mean, it's, I think of it a little bit like an advocacy toolbox. You don't always need every tool um, to get something done. Sometimes it's just a quiet conversation and the right briefing paper. Sometimes it's a well-placed opinion or editorial in a newspaper. Sometimes you have to throw everything at it uh, and have all six Ps working together in concert and uh, supporting one another. So we, that's why we develop this suite of tools um, and, and deploy them as we need to in order to get, in order to get things done. We're, um, we're very focused on being bipartisan and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, everything that we support has earned support from at least someone from each party, which we think is a, is a discipline that has really worked over time. Um, unlike so many domestic issues break down by party line with Democrats on one side and Republicans on the other, I, with, with groups like Bread for the World and One and so many others over many years, I think we've really built bridges to both parties uh, and created a safe space, frankly, uh, for both sides to support. And that has, that has helped our issues, which are not easy politically, and I'm going to say more about that in a minute. I think that's really helped us make the progress that we've made. Um, I read somewhere, and I, I, unfortunately I couldn't find a site before this class, but some brilliant person wrote that advocacy is a little bit like surfing. I don't know if any of you surf on waves and I would not call myself a surfer. I, I've done enough, I've done enough to, to appreciate this analogy, but the idea that advocacy is like surfing just really rings true for me. You, you have to be able to read the waves. You have to be able to see the currents. You've got to know where to avoid the rocks <laughs> and, and your timing has to be good. You really need to know where there is energy and where there's momentum and be able to get your issue into that sort of slipstream, into that wave. Um, it's, it's really, really hard to shape the weather and shape the waves. Some advocacy groups do that, but most often those are big cultural shifts or big moments in history like a pandemic, right? That is shaping the ocean and the weather that creates those waves. But we have to be really shrewd about knowing how to catch those waves and, and, and riding them and to, to make progress on our issues. And I think that's part of the art of advocacy that I love so much. Another is, another is um, so many advocates I see or some people interpret advocacy to be those who shout the loudest. And there's no doubt that there are interest groups who shout the loudest, who do have political power, but I've never thought of advocacy that way. And to, to be honest, shouting the loudest, I mean, it, it doesn't work with my friends. It doesn't work with my wife. I'm not sure why it would work with a Senator. So it, it's really about meeting people where they are and helping bring them to a new place. And that means speaking them to them in a language that they understand. It means, you know, respectful, putting yourself in their position, and it means leading them, finding some way of creating a path to, to, a, new, to a new position. So that's very much emblematic of the approach that the One Campaign takes with advocacy. So, so David asked me to talk about the politics of global poverty. Um, and I gotta be honest, the politics of global poverty are pretty terrible. Um, and I, I, let me unpack that, but I really think it's true. So what, so if, foreign aid is bad politics. What are good politics? So if you're a politician doing something that would be popular, something that would increase your profile, your image, something that might raise money, something that's gonna get you reelected, right? That most often means doing things that are doing something for your voters. You can go back home and say, I did this to del deliver for my state or for my town. Asking politicians to send their voters hard in tax dollars overseas to people that they'll never know or see, that's not super good politics. Um, you know, there's a strong charitable instinct in the United States, um, but it's, you know, the issues of foreign aid are really complicated. You know, global health and poverty are super multifaceted. There is no one easy solution. It takes a long time. And frankly, a lot of the issues we work on can sound hopeless and overwhelming, ending global hunger or ending extreme poverty or helping people, preventing people from dying from preventable diseases. 
most people think there's no chance that there's anything we can do on those issues. And so they disengage. Um, the charitable instincts, you know, sure, people are willing to chip in when times are good, but most often foreign aid is considered to be a luxury we can't afford. It's a nice to do. Everyone wants to help out. So if you ask them, oh, do you want to help kids make sure they have nutritious meals? Of course I do. Do you want to make sure kids get vaccinated? Oh, of course. But when you stack that up against their, the other priorities, whether it's fixing crumbling schools or reducing the deficit or, or something much more local, foreign aid drops to the bottom of the list. And then I, I think there's also a healthy dose of blame and frankly racism in some of American attitudes toward foreign aid. There must be something wrong with people who are extremely poor. I, that's, I think a factor even in our domestic uh, poverty, you know, people's views on domestic poverty. So, I, I, you know, that's a real, those are real factors, I think, not, not with all, but with some opposition. Um, I mean, global poverty is, and foreign aid is never part of a presidential campaign. Only one campaign that I've been involved in over 25 years has where the politicians made a pledge on it. Um, it, Joe Biden, you know, this last election never said a word about foreign aid, uh, foreign policy, sure, but foreign aid and poverty and, and, and um, disease was not on the, on the agenda. And you can understand why it doesn't, it's not going to be really key to get you vote, get you votes. Most of our political champions are usually longtime veterans in safe seats. So Given how rubbish the politics are, as I've just described, you might wonder why it has anything good has happened at all. Washington and Congress are so broken they can't even deal with the stuff that impacts their voters directly, let alone foreign aid. Um, another question David asked me was, do I think that advocacy is, has actually mattered? I, I think it's the only thing that's mattered. I know it's gonna sound a little self-serving, but I actually think foreign aid advocates are among the most sophisticated advocates in Washington. They have to be because none of the politics works on these issues. We have to figure out a way despite all the politics to get people on board. So I think the influence of advocacy in the US foreign assistance has been profound. Um, now, US foreign assistance, not just, I'm not suggesting for a second that advocacy has made all the progress against extreme poverty and preventable disease. I think David spoke in an earlier class uh, about the immense progress that's been made. I would attribute most of that to the people in these communities who are fighting hard every day, who are empowering themselves and against just innumerable odds, um, making their way up and bettering their, their futures. But to the extent we're talking about US foreign assistance, public policies in the US that can help and assist and partner with people in lower income countries, I really do think advocacy can claim the lion's share of the credit. I mean, just briefly look at the last sort of 15 or 20 years. Bill Clinton, international, you know, was the president uh, when the international debt relief Jubilee 2000, which culminated in a hundred billion dollars of unsustainable debts being canceled. One of the most unlikely campaigns and objectives, frankly, ever um, was adopted. He also adopted the first comprehensive policy related to trade in Africa. It's called AGOA, uh, the African Growth and Opportunity Act. George W. Bush continued debt relief from Clinton. Clinton mostly did bilateral, Bush did multilateral debt relief. President Bush, again, one of the most unlikely allies in this space, he adopted or he, he initiated something called the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which focuses large amount of investment in well-governed poor countries, a really innovative piece of policy. He also adopted you know, an historic HIV AIDS response. Uh, it's called PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Response for AIDS Relief, uh, which is probably familiar to you. He also initiated a, a presidential initiative on malaria, uh, which has had profound effects, uh, really reducing the number of malarial deaths around the world. Um, foreign assistance to Africa under Bush quadrupled. If you told me that that was a possibility, I would have laughed at you, but it, that is what happened. Obama, Feed the Future, something actually that Bread for the World played an enormously important role, which was uh, an, an initiative started from, from a dead stop. The United States was doing virtually nothing. David can confirm whether I'm accurate on this or not, but I believe we were doing very, very little in, um, um, 
in agriculture as a country before this. And from basically a standing start, stood up a billion dollar annual program to improve crop yields, to train farmers, to help farm to market roads and, and, and many, many other things. Another initiative that the one campaign was really in, engaged in was uh, electrification in Africa, trying to get first time uh, modern energy access. Seven out of 10 before this initiative, seven out of 10 people in Africa had no access. And you know it affected everything from refrigerators to being able to run a business to being able to stay up at night to study for school. So that was a huge success as well. And um, sort of interestingly, Obama really expanded um, antiretroviral treatment for HIV AIDS. He, he took the Bush initiative and really expanded on it. He will never get any credit for it. And, and Bush rightly, rightly does, I think, but Obama really built on it. Um, without, I, I hope it's clear that I'm a bipartisan guy. I give as much credit to Bush as I do to Clinton and Obama. Donald Trump was truly awful for our issues. Um, he campaigned against them and every budget that he put forward, he recommended 30 to 50% cuts to the poverty focused development assistance that I've been talking about. Um, but here's where all that success in the, in the preceding years really helped. The bipartisan, by, in bipartisan way, Congress rejected those cuts. Um, the president normally has enormous latitude over foreign affairs and, and foreign assistance. And the Congress just said, no way, we're not cutting these programs. We know they work. We know they deliver. It's the right thing to do. It contributes to our security. It's, you know, it is, it's, and so they rejected those cuts full stop. Um, so what I was gonna say is, again, given the politics are so, working against us, and given the progress I just described, you might be wondering how in the world does this happen? So uh, following a little bit of the pattern of the, of the six Ps, I thought I would describe some general observations I've had about the successes over the last 15 to 20 years. The, the first is gonna be obvious, but it, 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 there's no replacement for it, which is you have to have a good idea. You, you can't sell a bad policy, you know, along with bad politics. It just doesn't work. I've seen lots of bad policy passed that where all the politics were in its favor, hugely popular, but not very good policy. In, in this case, you need to come with a good, smart idea that really addresses the problem you're describing uh, and, um, and, uh, you know, and, and really resonates with, with the experts. Um, I, a corollary to that one is don't try to do too much. You, you just can't, you're never gonna be able to boil the ocean. With global poverty, the progress that we've seen has been built brick by brick by brick. Uh, and you know, you're, you're not gonna end global poverty with one bill. You're more likely to be able to increase crop yields or get people elect electricity or to really tackle a particular disease. Um, the capacity of Washington DC to, 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 to do good and big legislation is pretty small, um, especially if you wanna keep it bipartisan. The third lesson I've seen is on the message. The message is just crucial. You've got to keep it simple. Well, David and I often teach our grassroots about making an elevator pitch. That means if you got into the elevator mistakenly with a member of Congress, you have whatever that is, 20, 30 seconds to make your sell. Um, it also, oftentimes we look for ways of making the self-interest argument. Clearly it's the right thing to do. It resonates with a lot of people. Um, Many, most members of Congress came to Washington to make a difference in their country, in their community, and in the world. So doing things like foreign assistance and fighting extreme poverty and preventable disease is the right thing to do, and that's, that's a good argument. We, we can't overlook it. We also often make the economic case. 95% of American consumers live outside the United States. Uh, we're 5% of the world's population, so we need to, uh, we need to expand our markets. Um, we benefit from a vibrant and healthy global economy. The other argument that is um, a bit sort of self-interested or will attract politician support is the link of um, extreme poverty with national security. Now, those who are extremely poor are not security risks, but often um, poor and vulnerable places become safe havens for extremist elements. We see that across Africa, Syria, other places, um, ungoverned spaces. And so, you know, where there are vibrant communities and people are committed to their futures and their economies, um, extremist elements 
uh, have a harder time thriving. This, this element is, is a bit tricky. We don't want foreign aid to become a tool of our military. But I gotta say, I've talked to so many generals, four-star generals and others who are more eloquent um, spokes and advocates for foreign aid. They see why building schools, creating wells, building markets, creating transparency and responsive governance in uh, vulnerable communities actually contributes to to security, both there and globally. So there's that national security argument. The last thing I'll say on self-interest arguments is, of course, I spent most of my life trying to convince people why global health was important. Well, now that we're in a pandemic, you know, unfortunately, in a brutal way, this virus has made the case for, for us. Um, what goes on in other parts of the world are just a plane ride away. Look at the variants from the UK, Brazil, South Africa. They made it to the United States. They were detected in a matter of weeks. There, there is no wall or border or ocean big enough to stop these viruses from traveling. So it is actually in our interest what's going on in some of the most remote parts of the world. It is in our interest not just to vaccinate everyone in America, and I hope we do quickly. We have to vaccinate everybody. The, the worst thing that could happen is we get everybody vaccinated here and it's raging somewhere else and some variant comes along that our vaccines won't be able to tackle. We're literally in this boat together. Um, I'll try to go a little bit more quickly through the rest of this. We, are, we like to, we always try to find and create champions in the Congress or in the administration uh, and that we really wanna find support from those champions um, from both sides of the aisle. I often say the most effective advocates in Washington are the members of Congress themselves. They go and talk to each other on the floor of the House and the Senate in the gym. They have great relationships. And when you get someone who's really committed to your issue, it is the best asset you can have. You've got to mobilize grassroots voters. You want to get those voters to give the politicians their support, say thanks, give permission to take this vote where the politics generally doesn't work in their favor. And I'm not talking about creating movements. Everyone loves to talk about creating a movement. Honestly, I, I, I think that's, it's not necessary and it's extraordinarily hard to do. Um, what you need to do is create the impression of a movement. You need just enough people to weigh in, to make some noise uh, and give the impression that there are many, many other folks uh, behind you. Often there are those people behind you, but you just need to get a few of them to give that impression. One of the things with, we do also with foreign aid is you can make it multilateral, um, take it global. If you can get an initiative at a G7 or in some other way, get the United States to feel like, oh, other people are working on this issue, I better too. Um, I don't wanna look like the skunk at the garden party um, globally. The United States image globally is something that we play on quite a lot. And also it's helpful to say that we're not, the United States um, is not solely responsible for ending childhood nutrition. We're going to share the burden, um, share the costs and the, and, the, and the policy multilaterally. The last thing I'll say is I often think about who's going to stop an initiative from happening. You're like, who, you know, we're, we're a government of not consensus, but boy, that with our, with our shared responsibilities and, and um, you know, different branches of government where things can stop, who's going to, who's going to throw a wrench into the works? And I'll, I'll be, honest, it, it most often is Republicans, um, typically fiscal conservatives, uh, who, who are willing to throw a wrench into the works. And, and this is where I think the faith community comes in. The impact of people of faith on this agenda, whether it's Bread for the World, or the Catholic Bishops Conference, the Jewish community, or people of faith, like Nancy Pelosi or John Boehner, or so many, Chris Kuhn, so many politicians I could name who who come to these issues from a perspective of faith. And, it, and it's not hard to see why. Um, first of all, as I said earlier, doing the right thing, the moral case certainly resonates with people of faith. People shouldn't die for lack of medicine or food that we have in abundance here. Um, I mean, every faith community has this concept of a tithe. It's, we need to share some part of our immense blessing uh, to the least fortunate. And then quite practically, faith communities have international links. I, I, that, is, that is a super important um, connection to things beyond our borders. 
nut things to people and churches beyond our borders, whether that's through mission trips or partner churches, global, global networks. Um, I really do, the faith community brings a global perspective to the, and experience to the table that it really resonates with members of Congress. So I think people of faith help broaden the political aperture. Republicans and Democrats can find common ground rooted in a faith uh, tradition. All right, last thing I'm gonna say, and then I will open it up for whatever David wants to do. Just briefly looking ahead. The politics of foreign aid obviously are not looking any more favorable. Um, we are as divided as a country and as a Washington DC as we've ever been. Getting Republicans and Democrats to trust each other enough to do to join forces um, looks as difficult as at any time during my, my period in DC. But just yesterday, the top Republican and Democrat in the House and the top Republican and the Democrat in the Senate, leaders on these issues put together a bill uh, to, to try to tackle what comes after the pandemic. How are we going to prevent the next pandemic? Um, we saw Republicans and Democrats, although they didn't agree on the stimulus package that Biden proposed, behind the scenes there was, within that package, there was $11 billion of assistance for the global response. There was bipartisan support for that. So um, we've continued to find and be able to build common ground um, even you know, in this area. So, I mean, at one, we're really focused on the pandemic. We're focused on something called SDRs. Uh, it's an IMF currency that um, if all the members of the IMF agree, we can help issue new SDRs, which went, if recycled back to the poorest countries could really, really be a game changer for, for low-income countries. Uh, as coupled with that is additional debt relief. Um, we're very focused on sharing of do doses. I, I could go on for a long time on, on, on dose sharing. I'll just leave you with one stat. The United States now has secured, has purchased and access to enough doses to vaccinate every man, woman, and child in the entire country. And of course we know 25 to 30% won't, but we have enough doses. And we, in addition to that, we have another half a billion doses. So at a moment when in low-income countries have had only 0.2% of low-income countries have vaccinated their populations, we have a half a billion more doses than we need um, even if we vaccinated everyone. The UK is in a similar position. Canada is in a similar position. So rich countries have are hoarding doses, are hoarding the most, the hottest commodity on the planet right now. And we've got to do something about that. We're also raising money so that um, institutions that can purchase vaccines for poor countries have enough money to do so, and a bunch of other efforts, which I can go into greater detail if you're interested. Um, we're also pushing the Biden administration to double foreign assistance over the next four years over his first term. Um, we believe that this, you know, this this guy understands and supports our issues. He he's not the governor of some small state. He was the chairman of the committee responsible for these issues. So he's got a deep long history with foreign assistance and international engagement. And we believe he both understands this and the moment calls for it. A global pandemic, as I said earlier, proves the case to the American public that we are inevitably linked to, uh, to the rest of the community and that those communities who need our assistance, it is in our interest as well as the right thing to do to assist them. So we're hoping, and then climate change, immigration, refugee crisis, all of these things that we know the president wants to do is gonna require additional money. So we are working hard right now with many, many partners to hopefully increase the overall budget. And then last thing is, and, and David will know much more about this than I will, but um, very interesting new initiative to um, on nutrition, childhood nutrition, and the fact that there are some very simple, frankly, low cost interventions that would save millions and millions of kids' lives. The fact that we live in a world of plenty, we throw out you know, so much food every day, uh, and yet millions of kids still suffer from not just lack of food, but the debilitating um, nutrition deficit, which will impact their cognitive ability for their whole lifetimes. Uh, and so there's an initiative being put together by Bread for the World and other partners to um, have a presidential initiative um, on nutrition, which I'm very excited about. Part of it is that um, there is uh, a substantial body of new knowledge about how you reduce, uh, first, how much damage child nutrition does. It was 
like 15 years ago, that we get that we got the evidence that it's not just that it kills malnutrition is a, a cause of half the child deaths in developing countries. So it kills a lot of kids, but a lot more kids um, are stunted, which means their brains and bodies never develop properly often. And so what kills me is the brains. You know, that if, if, if in utero in the first two years of life, a child doesn't get uh, proper nutrition, it often uh, damages the brain power of that person for the rest of their, their life. And it's, it's irreparable damage. Um, you know, it's not automatic, it's statistical, of course, but uh, it is a real cruel reality. And then we also learned that um, from evidence for the first time funded by Gates Foundation and the World Bank, uh, studies around the world showed us some things that you could do that to make the, get the most possible bang for your buck on nutrition. And that, that uh, momentum of research has continued. So I'll send you, Tom, a, a report that the Eleanor Crook Foundation put together from their, their research staff on, the, on getting the policy right. What are the smart ideas? Um, one is in relationship to the vaccination campaigns. Um, there'll be vac there's, a, there's a lot of urgency about getting out COVID vaccines. Also, um, the, the tremendous progress that we had made against child vaccination or on child vaccination for deadly diseases, a lot of those vaccination programs shut down during the pandemic. So there's a backlog of kids who haven't gotten polio and haven't gotten those um, basic immunizations. Um, so you could have, uh, in some countries, it could be that you'd have COVID for mom and dad together with uh, infectious diseases, vaccinations for the kids. And then also you can drop, uh, you can give, you can drop, uh, give two, two drops of vitamin A supplement on the tongue of the kid. And that, uh, that also is a very, uh, it powerfully strengthens the body's own uh, immune system and uh, makes the vaccines work better. And it's just good nutrition. So moms are gonna be more likely to go in for the shots because they want, their, they want nutrition for their kids. We know that from nutrition programs that moms sort of push and shove and cheat a little bit to get supplemental food for their kids, even if they don't quite qualify. You know, if the kids aren't quite hungry enough, to, their, their arms aren't skinny enough, the moms want that nutrition. So uh, that's one of those good ideas. So I think we have the good, a package of good ideas which are now being embodied in bipartisan legislation in both houses. Um, there are good, strong sponsors on both sides in both houses that are lined up. Um, and then the other thing I think that, so I think, you know, let's say that gets introduced a month and a half from now or a month from now, it takes a while for the members of Congress to, for their staffs to wrap, wrap their minds around this so that they're really satisfied with what they're introducing. So it might be a month and a half from now, but then just the way bread, bread or one campaign work, you know, by, by September, we'll have bipartisan lists of 50 sponsors in the House and maybe eight in the Senate. And, uh, and then in September is the UN Food Conference. So, um, and on, you know, also President Biden will probably make one of his first foreign policy speeches at the General Assembly in November, simultaneously with the food conference. And on the food conference, you know, when we when when we go to the this year's uh, um, climate change conference, the United States goes into the climate change conference as a repentant sinner. <laughs> Whereas, you know, thanks to that bipartisan group in Congress on food. Our programs on food assistance, food aid, agriculture, and nutrition have been going strong. So we, and then uh, the US economy is strong in agriculture and food issues, uh, the nutrition programs in our own country. So the US sort of has bragging rights going in. And then it's in that context that President Biden could announce uh, 
uh, building on bipartisan interest in Congress, demonstrated interest, an initiative with the, which would then be supported by uh, that nutrition legislation when it finally moves. Just, I mean, the other thing is, as you know, but uh, students don't know, that um, Bread for the World worked the, in the last Congress on a nutrition resolution. And uh, the, that bipartisan nutrition resolution passed in both houses by big bipartisan majorities. Um, it passed the Senate um, uh, end of 19. So fairly recently, and so uh, the same people, the same people who signed, who were co-sponsors of that nutrition, like I think it's 141 members of the House. You can go back to that 141 members of the House who said we ought to continue and strengthen what we're doing on global nutrition, and say, okay, here's the legislation that will actually get things done. So I just think that all sets things up in a in a way that could could work. You know, that could. Everything seems to be aligned to win. It's a perfect illustration of how you overcome something that's not particularly politically helpful with all the things. So it's it's a compelling issue, kids dying for lack of key nutrition nutrients and a clear proposal that people can understand, vitamin A and you know, these this peanut butter enhanced, you know, uh, peanut butter, which is so it's a clear policy. You, you all did brilliant work creating champions on both sides with the resolution. So the resolu resolutions don't have the power of law, but they are basically like, I care about this issue. So Bread for the World did brilliant work to create broad education and buy-in to the issue of childhood nutrition globally in this last year. All of that now will be built on with this legislation. So you've built champions, you've got a clear message. The Nutrition Summit globally, as I said, Presidents and prime ministers go to these things. They don't want to look like schmucks. They want to look like they're leaders. So Biden's going to want to say something proactive here. And it's going to be really helpful if he's got bipartisan support in the Congress to deliver something real. So anyway, you, you begin to see in that specific example how you begin to build a case and a campaign for foreign aid 